is that it is the transformative action of microorganisms. Anyone with a biology background is already shaking their heads when I say that. Um, because, uh, you know, for biologists, fermentation means something that is both more specific and also in a way broader. For biologists, fermentation is the production of energy without oxygen, anaerobic metabolism. And um, the cells of our bodies are capable of fermentation. I mean, we mostly function under respiration. You know, we have this elaborate system that carries oxygen from our lungs to every cell in our bodies. And, um, you know, our, 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 our cells can produce energy most efficiently using oxygen. <laughs> But sometimes we exert ourselves. Like, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm like determined to move this giant counter that weighs however many hundred pounds by myself. And I'm, I'm exerting myself. And, you know, sometimes when you're exerting yourself, you're basically demanding that, um, you know, sort of muscles uh, 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 in certain part of your body produce more energy than they have oxygen to produce. So they revert to this alternative mode of energy production, which is fermentation. And it's less efficient in that it creates a byproduct. The byproduct is lactic acid. So, you know, if you feel the sensation of a muscle you've been exerting, like kind of burning, like that's lactic acid from your cells switching uh, over to their fermentative mode. Um, so, okay, most of the foods and beverages that we describe as fermentation meet the biologist's definition. So, you know, when we shred cabbage and other vegetables and salt it and ferment it under a brine, um, you know, that's an anaerobic process that does not require oxygen. When we crush grapes and ferment their juice into wine, that's an anaerobic process that does not require oxygen. When we, um, uh, um, you know, introduce a, a yogurt culture into milk and then, um, you know, incubate it uh, just above body temperature, that's an anaerobic process. It does not require oxygen. Most of the foods and beverages that we call fermented meet the biologist's definition, and there's no problem. The problem is that there are a big handful that require oxygen. So like vinegar. You know, the way alcohol becomes vinegar is there are organisms that require oxygen, uh, acetobacter, and in the presence of oxygen, they'll turn alcohol into acetic acid. So vinegar is sort of, I mean, to a strict biologist, it's not even fermented because it's a, the product of an aerobic process. Uh, kombucha, you have to do kombucha in an open vessel. It's got a lot of vinegar organisms that are part of it. And, and in order to you know, turn your sweet tea into kombucha, you need oxygen. If you want to grow a fungus, uh, uh, whether it's um, um, the koji that we'll be making this morning, the tempeh that we'll be making this afternoon, uh, blue cheese, camembert cheese, uh, um, you know, anything where you're uh, kind of growing a mold, um, you need oxygen. So I call these the oxymoronic ferments because they, <laughs> sort of, you know, they contradict the biologist's most basic understanding of what is fermentation, and that's why I prefer to work with this broader lay definition. Fermentation is the transformative action of microorganisms. But, of course, not every transformative action of microorganisms results in something delicious that we want to put into our mouths. And, um, you know, I dare say that most people's, um, you know, most uh, vivid experiences with the transformative action of microorganisms are, let's say, cleaning the refrigerator. <laughs> that, like, bag of cilantro that you forgot about four weeks ago, and it's just, like, decomposing into this sort of green mush. Nobody calls that fermented. Like, that's not fermented cilantro. That's like, you know, that's decomposing. That's rotting. That's spoiling. We have this, you know, we have this whole other vocabulary to describe, um, you know, the undesirable uh, microbial decomposition of foods. And we reserve the word fermentation to describe desirable or intentional microbial transformations. You know, but it's not like everybody agrees on what's desirable. Um, and, you know, definitely, you know, there are lots of examples of, you know, one, uh, you know, cultural traditions, like, you know, greatest culinary achievement being, you know, some other cultural traditions like worst nightmare. <laughs> and, um, you know, you could certainly, uh, I, I mean, you know, there's probably cheeses that, you know, we could, most of us would be grossed out by and never think about putting in our mouths. And, um, you know, if you start going into the world of like, you know, fermented fish, um, um, you know, definitely there's some very, very funky products that are kind of notorious and, you know, usually people who haven't grown up around them or at least been exposed to them, 
you know, we'll just look at that and say, like, that's that's rotten. I mean, that, that makes me nauseous just looking at it and smelling it. I'd never think about putting it in, in my mouth. So, I mean, it's not like there is, um, uh, like, a sharp, objective line that science has drawn that, like, separates, you know, what is fermented and what is rotten. I'm not saying you could just go into the compost and eat anything and it would be safe. I'm just <laughs> saying that, like, you know, our concepts of what is appropriate to put in our mouth are largely subjective and culturally determined. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, but I would say what really like marks fermentation is there's something intentional or that someone perceives as desirable going on and it's not just random decomposition. And so, you know, what we now understand that people, you know, for most of the history of fermentation did not clearly understand is that this is the action of microorganisms and that Everything we eat, all of the plants and all of the animal products that make up our food are populated by microorganisms and never just one singular microorganism, always these elaborate communities of microorganisms. And really, you know, the question in fermentation is which ones are going to develop? Um, and so, you know, really the practice of fermentation is a matter of creating different kinds of selective environments that have the effect. And so what I mean by selective environment is, you know, let's say a temperature range, let's say adding salt to something, let's say leaving a surface exposed to oxygen. Um, you know, I mean, um, uh, different surface, different kinds of environmental requirements, and we'll, that's what really mostly we'll be talking about is what kind of environment you're creating for different things. And I mean, there's no rule of thumb. It's not like all ferments require the same kinds of conditions. I mean, some require protection from oxygen, some require a lot of oxygen, some require a flow of oxygen, but we don't want them to dry out. Um, you know, some require a, you know higher temperature, some require a lower temperature, some are very flexible. It can happen. In a wide range of temperatures, but most of the things we're doing amount to manipulations of environmental conditions that have the effect of encouraging the growth of certain kinds of organisms while simultaneously discouraging the growth of other kinds of organisms. And I mean, I mean, I can't believe how many articles I read that are like, you know, think that organisms are divided into good and bad ones, and that, you know, fermentation somehow makes the good ones flourish and makes the bad ones disappear. I mean, it's not quite as straightforward as that. I mean, you know, it, I mean, there's not like a registry of good and bad. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, we really don't know enough about bacteria to be making sort of ultimate um, sort of moral judgments uh, on them. Like that. Um, so you know, so we're 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 learning, but 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 you're, we're always trying to encourage some, and by the growth of some, discourage others. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, there's always a practical benefit to fermentation. Your food is not decomposing into a disgusting, ugly mess, you know, and you're producing alcohol. You're making something that's more stable for storage. You're making something that's more easily digestible. You're making something that loses some toxin. You're making something that's more delicious. Like, there's always some benefit uh, uh, to fermentation. Um, a lot of people... I mean, including me, I, I mean, you know, sort of emphasize the preservation aspect of fermentation. I mean, you know, certainly for, you know, people in temperate regions with limited growing seasons, our preservation is a, you know, sort of a really important aspect that has made human uh, a, a settlement possible in parts of the world where, you know, food wouldn't be available all, all year around. But um, preservation is by no means the only benefit of fermentation. Um, and certain kinds of ferments have nothing to do with preservation. Um, like I was, there's a new book about doses, which is really, really excellent book, and I gave them a blurb, and you know, and, and really like they'll help they'll help you improve your dosa game. Mm -hmm. But they made this one, you know, they they were just talking about the phenomenon of fermentation in relation to doses, and that fermentation is an ancient process to preserve food. I mean. Fermentation is an ancient process. Fermentation preserves food, but I mean, the oldest ferments are not thought to have primarily been about preservation. They've been about partying. Yeah. They've been about getting closer to God. Uh -huh. um, you know, they, they, they've been about altering uh, a consciousness. Um, you know, and you know, certainly if you're taking fruit and you're making wine, I mean, you could talk about that as a, it's a preservation process as well, but preservation is not what drives all fermentation. And in fact, the preservation of grains and beans 
I mean, I would argue that they have nothing to do with preservation. I mean, you know, these foods are, like, this is a lot more stable than anything we're going to ferment out of it, right? I mean, so in its mature state, a bean or a grain is dry. That dryness is what enables me to just put it in a jar and, you know, use it for months. And, yeah, I mean, I would recommend people not hold on to food for years. I mean, it does, it, it does degrade. Beans become harder to get soft. But, I mean, you know, certainly you could store this for, for, for years. As long as you keep it uh, uh, dry, it's very, very stable. Um, and so the first step of every fermentation of beans and of grains is to introduce water. So, you know, when, these, when this dries on the plant, it's not drying in a sterile environment. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's covered with this, like, elaborate community of different kinds of organisms. And, you know, as it dries out and they lose their access to water, that, like, they're not going to die. The individuals are not going to die. They're just going to go into a state of dormancy. And so they're there. And then that's what happens whenever we add water to, to something. So, like, this is... This is millet that uh, some of the people who got here early milled, and then we just put it on water. So this has been on water for you know, not quite 24 hours. And if you look up close, it's, there's bubbles all along the surface. Like bubbles are the signs of life in fermented liquids. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the millet just had, you know, whatever assortment of organisms. Like we know because they're always present that, that among them are going to be yeasts and lactic acid bacteria and and other things and they're just like coming to life as a result of adding water and so you know the the stability of the millet is already um eroding like you know nothing we're going to do with the millet now is going to be about making it more stable for long-term preservation than it was when it was dry uh in the, in the jar but of course, you know, the, the qualities that make a food stable for a long time dry can make things very indigestible. And this was one of the insights of uh, uh, Weston Price and that the Weston A. Price Foundation has been promoting that grains and beans have all kinds of, you know, anti-nutrient compounds that, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, if you look at things in the big, like, biological scheme of things, like, the plant wants to reproduce. The plant wants to discourage critters from us from eating their seeds. Um, and so, you know, the plant has evolved with all of these sort of anti-nutrient compounds to make them not such great food. Um, um, and, uh, and so, I mean, fermentation is a way of breaking down these anti-nutrient compounds and of making the, the food more digestible. And one way that grains are, are really not digestible is that, um, I mean, they're full of minerals, but the minerals are tied up in these chemical bonds called, called um, uh, uh, phytate bonds, mm -hmm. um, which our digestion can't break down. And so if you soak them and initiate a fermentation, the fermentation breaks down the phytate bonds and makes the minerals more available. And there's a lot of interesting studies where they'll take, let's say, the, so, okay, um, for lunch we're going to have dosa. And I'll, um, uh, 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 the, the batter's up in the warm zone up on my desk, um, but I'll, I'll bring it down uh, uh, in a little bit. But um, it's, it's basically a fermentation of rice and lentils. If you take the same rice and lentils and you just like cook them and send them to a lab for analysis um, uh, and then you ferment them for you know 12 hours and send the batter or the finished dosa to the same lab they're going to find much higher levels of calcium iron and other minerals in the fermented version because of the sort of the, the way that fermentation breaks down these phytate bonds and sort of liberates the minerals and makes them much more bioavailable to us. Um, you know, the, the phytoestrogens in soybeans, the tryptin in inhibitors, just like lots of different, um, uh, uh, you know, chemical compounds that I definitely do not fully understand, but that you sort of read about in the critiques of soybeans or of wheat or, 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 or different grains, break down under fermentation. Even gluten breaks down under fermentation. Not by yeast, 
but by bacteria. So, of course, until the 20th century, there was no such thing as yeast without bacteria. Like, you know, the 10,000 year history of bread is all about, you know, fermenting wheat with the community of organisms that's found on wheat that will always include yeast, but will also always include lactic bacteria. So, the lactic bacteria that produce lactic acid are what make us call a sourdough sour. Mm-hmm. Although, I mean, some bakers, you know, vehemently um, dislike the word sourdough because the style of bread that they're making isn't sour at all. And, you know, you, you, your bread doesn't have to be sour because you're um, um, using natural leavening. That's all a question of technique. So, you know, I mean, French breads have traditionally been made with natural leavening just as much as German or Danish breads. And just the technique that they, you know, developed in Germany and Scandinavia was for much sourer breads. And the technique that they developed in France uh, minimized the, the sourness. So it's just all about, like, how you use that leavening. Um, but it's not intrinsically sour. But you know, the, the, la- the lactic bacteria actually break down gluten, and so you get much lower levels of gluten in a well-fermented loaf. The more you ferment it, the more of the gluten will be uh, uh, broken down. Um, okay, so our, so our theme this morning is grains. 